I want you to try to picture this. It's New York City in 1917, late on a Friday afternoon, the week before summer starts. Emma Goldman is working in her newspaper office. Her office is on the second floor. It's up a rickety flight of stairs from the street, and it's a crowded place. There are always people coming and going. There's her own staff. There's another newspaper upstairs, so they have people coming and going. There are customers who come to pick up newspapers and pamphlets. There are reporters from different papers who come by to try to get story ideas. So there's a lot of noise. But this time, she hears something different. She hears people coming up the stairs, but it's not one or two people. It's a crowd of people. She has to know who this is. You see, she'd given a lecture just the night before. In the lecture hall was a sold out crowd of 800 people. But that's not all. Outside, there were 30,000 protesters in the park trying to get in. Goldman had been telling people for weeks that they didn't have to sign up for the World War I draft and that if they didn't, her group, the No Conscription League, would support them. The federal government did not like her doing that. Just that morning, Federal Marshal Thomas McCarthy was quoted in the paper giving her a direct warning. He said, Her time is growing short, and it would be well for her to get that through her head. So when she heard that crowd coming up the stairs, she had to know who it was, right? And don't forget, back in 1917, the NYPD could have sent a couple of patrolmen to make arrests. They do that every day. That would not have been hard. But that was not who was coming. Coming up the stairs were Marshal McCarthy himself, three of his assistants, an assistant United States attorney, and accompanying them from the NYPD was Sergeant George Barnett, famously of the bomb squad, two detectives, and a stenographer, and all accompanied by a crowd of newspaper reporters. I don't know the number of reporters that were there, so I don't know the exact size of the crowd of men that were standing in her office staring her down. But to be conservative, let's say it was at least 10. She looks at them, and the first thing she does is demand to see the evidence that's going to be the basis of her arrest. And in response, they just hand her the current edition of her own newspaper. And she looks at them, and I try so hard to visualize this scene and put myself in her mindset. But honestly, I don't have her courage. I don't have her nerve. Here she is, staring down this group of NYPD officers and federal agents who've come to arrest her. She just looks at them, and she says... Did you think I was guarded by a regiment? I mean, can you imagine? Then the officers break into two groups. One group goes upstairs to the other newspaper office. Let's talk about this office for a second. This paper is run by Goldman's closest friend and former lover, Alexander Sasha Berkman. Just how closely the two papers are working together becomes a major point of contention at their trial. So we're not going to discuss that too much right now. We're going to talk about that in a later episode. But the police are there to arrest him also. Goldman and Berkman are going to become the two main characters of the story we're going to tell. Right now, I just want to flag the names of their two respective newspapers because it says a lot about their individual personalities. They were both anarchist papers, but she chose to call hers Mother Earth, while his was called The Blast. Back downstairs, the group of police who stayed there are busy raiding the office, and they're confiscating all sorts of things. They're taking mailing and subscription lists, partially because they want the list of names because they think they might want to follow up and do further questioning of other people. They're taking back issues of the newspaper, they're taking all the literature, and they're generally turning the place over. Goldman won't talk to them, but she does want to talk to the reporters. And what she says is, This is no surprise to me, nor is it a new experience. In fact, it is my tenth arrest. But one must expect this sort of thing if one is fighting for an ideal. My name is Jeff Grossman, and this podcast is Across from Jericho, which is going to be a history of activism. This season's going to focus on Goldman and Berkman and the No Conscription League and their work to support people who don't want to register for the draft, more popularly known as slackers. It's all going to lead up to their federal criminal trial for conspiracy charges, but we're going to get a lot more into that later. At first, a couple things you might be wondering. One is, who am I? I just want to make clear at the outset, I'm not a historian. I'm a lawyer and maybe more importantly, a journalist, and maybe most importantly, I've been thinking about this for a long time. The second question is, what does across from Jericho mean? I'm not a particularly religious person, and this is absolutely not a religious podcast, but it comes from the part of the Bible I had to memorize for my bar mitzvah, 
And Rabbi Rick Block, if you're listening, I apologize if I mangle the story up, but it's how I remember it. Moses is leading the Jews through the desert, and they had already escaped from Egypt a long time ago, and they've been in the desert for a while. Moses is already part of the Red Sea, and they're wandering around, kind of having an idea where they're going, but they're thirsty, and they're hungry, and it's hot, and they're irritated. And they go to Moses, and they're complaining. They're saying, why did you take us out of Egypt? At least we had food there. Now we have nothing. And Moses, he is in no mood to deal with this. For one thing, this isn't the first time they've come to him complaining about this. And even more significantly, he had just finished burying his older sister in this unknown stretch of desert sand. So he goes to God and has a sidebar and says, look, what do you want me to do about this? You told me to take the people out of Egypt and they're complaining and they're thirsty and I don't know what to tell them. So God says, don't worry about it. Take your stick, the same stick that you used to part the ocean, and just go and talk to a rock. And the rock is going to give you water and everything is going to be all set. So Moses goes to this rock, and all the people are standing there looking at him. And he says to them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Which is old-timey for really pissed off. And he doesn't talk to the rock like God told him to. Instead, he takes a stick and smashes the rock. And water comes out, and it's clean, and it's fine. And the people are no longer thirsty, and they have water to feed their cattle. But now God is mad. God is so mad that he tells Moses, that Moses is not going to be allowed to enter into the land of Israel. After doing all this work and being Moses, he himself is not going to be able to enjoy it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. They get to the Jordan River right across from Israel, and Moses climbs up on a mountaintop, and it's across from Jericho, and he sees the promised land, and he drops dead. I mean, if Moses himself is not a good enough person to belong in the promised land, who is? One of my favorite writers, Henry Miller asked almost the exact same question, and it's quoted in the movie Reds, which is mostly about the writers John Reed and Louise Bryant, but Emma Goldman is their friend and one of the supporting characters. And it's all about how they went to revolutionary Russia because they thought they were creating a paradise. And Henry Miller, who, by the way, credited Emma Goldman for being his inspiration for becoming a writer in the first place, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, they wanted to save all of humanity. But that was too big of a job even for Jesus himself. So my question is this. These people, they're well-meaning. They actually are trying to save the world. But people are people. People are angry. The world is not a perfect place. Can people do the job? Is anybody capable of saving the world? Or are we all just fundamentally too human for that? And is it worth trying? Well, I want you to think about that. That's what this whole podcast is about. That's the question. Or really the two questions. Can we do it? And is it worth trying? I want you to think about this with me. And I want to hear what you think. Because it's an important question. And one that's really been haunting me. Are we good enough? Can we be good enough? There's a song that really captures the essence of what I'm trying to say. And it gets stuck in my head a lot. It's the song Woodstock, written by Joni Mitchell. You probably know the lyrics. We are stardust billion-year-old carbon. We are golden, caught in the devil's bargain, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. What is this devil's bargain? Are we really caught in it? Can we get ourselves back to the garden? But that's enough philosophizing for this episode. We'll probably do a little bit more of it along the way, but I don't want you to think we're going to get too deep about this whole thing. I'm here to tell you a story, and here's what the story is going to include. We're going to talk about anarchists and bombings, and we're going to talk about innocent people who spent decades in prison for a bombing they didn't do based on a lie, even after the original trial judge and the president himself had written to the governor about it. We're going to talk about women's rights and birth control and government censorship. We're going to talk about the Homestead Steel Strike, a botched prison escape, about the shooting of President McKinley, and also about an ice cream parlor in Worcester, Massachusetts. So stick around. Let's see what we find out. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and to tell your friends. Check out acrossfromjericho.com for all sorts of good stuff like pictures, transcripts, show notes, and links to all of our socials. Across from Jericho is a Split River Media production, researched and narrated by me, Jeff Grossman. This episode starred Sarah Natacheni as Emma Goldman, 
and Nathan Repaz as U.S. Marshal Thomas McCarthy. Audio mixing and sound design by Scott Rosenthal. Logo and graphics by Mark Richard Smith. The website was designed by Alec Farrell, and the theme music is Yo Cool by Alexander Nakarada. Special thanks to Brad Jarman, Teresa Buchheister, the Emma Goldman Papers Public History Project, Karen J. Greenberg, and Ethan Nickturn. Dedicated to the memory of my dad, Richard Grossman. Copyright 2023 by Split River Media, LLC.